Good morning, Ohio. James Ernest of the Grueling Truth Radio Network here with Brian Hoke, author of The Baby Bombers, the inside story of the next Yankee dynasty. Brian, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So what inspired you to write the book? Well, the, uh, the idea behind the book was to kind of detail the transition from how Derek Jeter's Yankees became the Aaron Judge Yankees of today. And so I uh, went through my daily work uh, as the Yankees reporter for MLB.com. I obviously have uh, a lot of contact with the key players in that uh, story, and it's uh, – not just the players on the field, but general manager Brian Cashman, um, you know, the scouts who were out there trying to find amateur talent, living out of their cars 180, 200 days a, a year, kind of patrolling the entire United States, the, um, the international scouts. So really, I wanted to peel back the layers of the onion and uh, show how a major league baseball organization works and tries to find and develop talent in this day and age. Wow. I mean, yeah, it's amazing the amount of access and amount of the inside story that you're able to uh, reveal to our uh, listeners. Yeah, no, thank you. I uh, That was really what I wanted to detail because, uh, you know, the players, obviously the Yankees have a lot of exciting talent. Uh, guys like Aaron Judge, Gary Sanchez, Luis Severino, all these guys have come up through the system and have become stars here at the big league level. And I wanted to tell the story not just of them, but also the people who made this happen, who were behind the scenes and kind of why they were, why these players were picked over other choices and uh, how you find talent like that and, you know, how you evaluate it, how you negotiate those contracts. So I, I, hopefully we were able to, to detail all of that and take people through the 2017, 2018 seasons. And now, uh, you know, the Yankees are poised here. They've got the nice core ready to go, and they've added Garrett Cole, and he's supposed to be the, the icing on top of the cake. So whenever we do get baseball again, uh, we'll see if the, the experiment works. So who are the current core for the Yankees? <laughs> you know, I, I think it's unfair to compare these guys against Derek Jeter, Jorge Posada, Andy Pettit, Mariano Rivera, just because that was such a special group to all come together and all develop at the same time but I would have to say that what the Yankees have done is made some very smart moves not just developing Gary Sanchez their starting catcher Aaron Judge will be out in right field um, Severino is out for this year be with Tommy John surgery but I would certainly put him in that group uh, they've made some very smart trades over the last few years and that's in the book too about uh, how Brian Cashman is able to find this talent uh, you know they made a very wise trade for Didi Gregorius but people didn't see uh, the value there he gave the Yankees several years of above average production. Uh, Glaber Torres is now going to be their starting shortstop. I think he would be in the Yankees' core four, quote unquote. Um, you know, they've they've had a nice blend of these young players coming up. Made some smart moves. Trade for Luke Voigt, for example, who was a guy nobody really had heard of, and is now their starting first baseman. So they've done a good job of identifying this talent in their early to mid twenties, where other teams have given up. Gio Urshela, Mike Topman are other examples. Um, you know, the Yankees, it's always a strength of theirs to throw the wallet out there. They're always going to have that financial advantage. But I think what Cashman and the front office have proved here, they could work under a small market model, too, if they had to. They, they, they'll never get that chance, but they could have done it if they had to, if they, if they wanted to run Kansas City or Cincinnati. They could, they could run the team like that, too. So how has uh, or how's, uh, Aaron Boone done as the, in the manager chair? I think he's done a good job. I really do. Um, you know, considering he had no prior managerial or coaching experience to come in and be handed the reins of this team, uh, he's now the first manager in Major League history to win 100 games in his first two seasons. He won 103 last year, took the team to the ALCS. So I think that, um, you know, Booney was prepared from an early age. He grew up in the Phillies clubhouse. His dad was playing for Philadelphia. Um, I mean, he's literally a, a three- or four-year-old kid in a baseball clubhouse. So, um, you know, his grandfather played Major League ball. His brother played Major League ball. And, and Aaron had a solid career as well. Of course, he had that one great moment where he won the pennant for the Yankees. And I think that, um, you know, he was prepared for this very early on. I think that his time as a broadcaster helped him, especially dealing with the media and to understand that side of it, which is obviously a huge prerequisite when you're in New York City. And um, I, I think that uh, he was handed the keys to a 
a pretty ready-made team there. I, I liken it a lot to being given the keys to a Porsche or a Lamborghini and, and the owner telling you, all right, keep it on the road, keep it between the white lines, don't drive it into the ditch. And I think he's done a good job of that. He's not only kept it on the road, but he's put the accelerator down and he's gotten them further than, uh, than I think a lot of people might have thought. Despite their uh, immense amount of winning, a lot of people consider last year an injury-plagued season. How did the Yankees avoid another injury-plagued season? Oh, it was. I mean, it was historic in nature. They had 30 different players on the injured list, uh, 39 stints, and those, those were both major league records, and it was nothing like I've ever seen before. You know, I was there every day writing the injury updates, and it was like, how can this still be happening? What's going wrong here? Um, so what they did was, uh, during the offseason, they essentially cleaned house as far as their training staff, their, their medical staff. Um, you know, there are still some guys coming over, but they went after one of the big names in the field who's Eric Cressy who's based up in uh, Massachusetts and he's uh, considered kind of this wizard of uh, training and strength conditioning and so he's overseeing all their efforts right now you know we, we saw some more injuries in spring training this year uh, before the coronavirus shut down so but some of that was still a hangover from last year for example Severino needed Tommy John surgery that was an injury that dated back to October. Aaron Judge was dealing with an injury that dated back to September. So I think that uh, the goal is once they clear the hangover effect from 2019, which, like I said, was a once in 100 years type of uh, injury season, they should be able to be healthy. And that is one of the silver linings of uh, the shutdown, as Judge said, um, when they, when, if and when baseball does come back, and I do believe it will come back, you know, the Yankees should be close to full strength when they get these guys out there. Was Derek Cole the right choice for the Yankees? I think he was. I mean, I, I think that, you know, it's hard to argue with a guy who um, I think could have won the Cy Young, probably deserved to win the Cy Young Award last year. Um, the fact you're taking him away from the team that knocked you out of the postseason last year and putting him on, at the front of your staff, and that was considered the, uh, the Achilles heel of the Yankees, so to speak, was that they didn't have the starting pitching. And even though you go back into the postseason, it wasn't starting pitching that killed him. It was a lack of situational hitting. Um, anytime you can add a, a stud like that, one of the top five pitchers in the game, um, arguably arguably the top pitcher in the game, um, yeah, I think that's going to make your staff better. And I think beyond that, it's the personality. That's what I saw in the first four or five weeks of spring training was the way this guy fit into the room. I thought that was a perfect fit. Um, his locker became Grand Central Station for guys wanting to come around and talk pitching. He seemed to see things on a different level and seemed to be the right guy at, at the right moment for this team. So I think that, yeah, he's, like I said, the icing on top of a championship cake that was uh, ready to be eaten whenever we do get back and playing ball again. So where would you rate the Yankees' rotation compared to the rest of uh, Major League Baseball? I, I think you'd have to put it uh, near the top. Um, you know, I think that uh, when you have Cole at the top, that obviously is a huge difference maker. Um, I, I think that uh, the questions you have are below that. Obviously, you'd like to have Luis Severino back when you're not going to this year. But Masahiro Tanaka has been very solid. Uh, during his career here with the Yankees, um, I, I think he's he's a solid number two. Like I said, um, you know they they were going to have James Paxton back. I think at some point in May and June, and so it sounds like he'll be ready for opening day. And Paxton, obviously, we saw it last year. He threw the no hitter when he was with Seattle. He's he's a huge difference maker. I like that top three, especially for a postseason series. Cole Tanaka and Paxton. Uh, beyond that, you'd have Jay Happ. You'd have Jordan Montgomery, who looked very good this spring. So, I mean, I think that when you're looking at the American League East, uh, the Yankees were the team to beat. Uh, Tampa Bay was going to give them a good push, and Tampa Bay starting pitching is excellent. Uh, they probably have the edge to some extent over the Yankees, but I think the Yankees are a more complete juggernaut, and they're going to score a ton of runs when they, uh, when they finally get the green light to get back out there. So if the Yankees are the odds-on favorites for the AL, who in the NL should they be concerned about? Oh, wow. Well, you know, I think you got to look at, obviously, the first thing you got to do is uh, the defending champions, the Washington Nationals, and they had a magical run to the sea, to the, uh, the postseason, and they were, they really had a special story, and, you know, <laughs> I think the Major League Baseball owes them a debt of gratitude, because, uh, you know, imagine if the Astros had won the World Series, and they were the defending champions, uh, 
with all this going down. So Washington, I mean, that was kind of a, a storybook grind to the end, and nobody gave that team a whole lot of a chance. So, I, you know, hey, I, I think that uh, there's a lot of, in the East in particular, there's a lot of teams that could be contending for a championship. You know, Joe Girardi is obviously a, a major character in my book and because he had the reins of the Yankees in 2017 and it gave way to Boone. And so I'm very interested to see what he does with Philadelphia. I think that he's going to get those guys playing. I, I, I know he's going to run a tight ship and I have a, a lot of confidence in that. So, uh, you know, certainly, I, and then that should be good and solid as well. So um, I, I would pick those three teams as the, uh, and kind of teams that the Yankees can keep their eyes on um, just in terms of teams that could be headed toward October. And then, of course, the Dodgers. I mean, you keep wondering when it's all going to come together. And they've made that big trade for Mookie Betts. And, um, you know, they've obviously been to the Fall Classic, but their most recent championship is 1988. So you, you kinda, it is, they're certainly due as well. So they, it's, it's not going to be cake, no cakewalk to the, uh, the final round for the Yankees, that's for sure. People are suggesting with this season not being a complete season, this is a time to try new things, a time to try DH in both leagues. What do you think about uh, trying new things uh, in a shortened season? I love the idea of trying new things. I don't want to see the DH in the National League this year, but I do want to see... Um, expanded rosters, for example, I think uh, weekly double headers would be a great way that they can make up kind of some of the lost games. Um, I think that uh, you can expand the playoffs, for example, um, maybe turn it into more of a round robin tournament. Um, I think that everything should be on the table here. Um, I, I do think the DH in both leagues is going to be inevitable at some point. I think that is going to come, but I don't necessarily think a shortened season is where you want to bring it in. Um, but I, I do think that. Look, I mean, it's so hard to forecast because none of us know when the start date is. Um, you're you're kind of just waiting on things that are bigger than baseball, bigger than all of us. You're, you're waiting on clearance from the federal and state governments to get the all clear to, to get guys back in the clubhouse and on the field again. And so until you get that, it's really hard to forecast how shortened of a season we're going to have. Is it going to be a four-month season? Is it going to be two months? I don't know. Um, so I think that uh, it's all going to depend on when you do get that green light and get these guys back and revved up for spring training, spring training number two. And then by then, um, we should have a pretty clear indication. But, you know, baseball was going to try some new things anyway this year. Today, this was the first year where uh, you were going to have to have pitchers face a minimum of three batters before you can make a pitching change. So I don't see why not add a few more things in there and see if they work, see if they don't work. And if they don't, then you throw them out. And if you do, you keep them. You mentioned the Houston Astros. How will fans react? How do you feel that they're going to take what they did? <laughs> they were already hearing it down here in spring training before things shut down. And I think that they were headed for what I said was going to be one of the most miserable 95 to 100 win seasons for the Houston Astros. And so if you're getting booed by the crowds down here in West Palm Beach where the, the average age is about 65 and people are just down here in their happy, uh, sunny spring training bubble, um, I, I think that uh, it was going to be brutal as they went around. Now maybe the, maybe the reaction is softened now. Maybe, maybe we'll be just so happy to have baseball and professional sports back that it's going to be swept under the rug, so to speak. But I think that there are people who are going to remember it. And um, I, I think that it's going to be a long road for them to, to win back the public trust. And, and maybe they never can. I don't know. Maybe that mark can never come away. Maybe they'll always have to carry that scarlet letter of the 2017 season. And, um, but certainly what we saw, the small sample down here in spring training, it was pretty uh, pretty brutal and vicious considering you know, you've got 5,000 people in a, you know, very, like I said, a retirement community and enjoying the nice weather. So I think when you get 55,000 people up at somewhere like Yankee Stadium, um, it's going to be loud and it's going to be pretty nasty. You're an extremely established writer, uh, been writing, uh, base, covering baseball for a long time. Uh, do you have a uh, Hall of Fame vote? I don't yet. And it's, uh, yeah, I still got to wait because uh, even though I've, 
covered baseball for more than 10 years, uh, they didn't allow internet writers in the DDWA until a few years ago. So my clock started from zero, even though I'd been on the beat for more than a decade. So um, still waiting on that. I do get to vote on some of the other awards, Cy Young, Rookie of the Year. Um, but uh, no, didn't get to cast my vote. So if you're asking me, was I the one who didn't vote for Derek Jeter? I was not. But yeah, I would have I would have voted for Derek. Oh, definitely. No, I agree with that 100%. No, the reason why I was asking is because I want to ask you about someone who was up for Hall of Fame and unfortunately didn't get it. Um, next Tuesday, I have uh, Louis Tian uh, as my guest. Uh, why do you think he's not in the Hall of Fame? It's a great question. I think that it, probably now it's up to in the hands of the Veterans Committee. Um, I, I think that you know, I'd have to look more at the numbers on Tion, but I mean, what a great career he had. And I think that, uh, you know, it's definitely one of those cases where I think that that's why you have a veterans committee to kind of go back and look at and be examined by a, a group of your peers, because I think that that is a definitely a career. And I just saw him. He was down here in Florida. They did a... Uh, kind of a round table where uh, members of the Yankees of the 70s and the Red Sox of the 70s were together and Susan Waldman moderated it and he was hilarious man he was he was <laughs> you know they could tell some stories about the old days you get all those guys up on the same stage and uh, get the beers flowing and they had a good time up there so that was a lot of fun um, you know I, I'm actually too young to have seen El Teante pitch he retired before I was born I'm, I'm 38 so um, I, I think that that's what is great about having a veteran committee where you have a group of hall of famers of that era to judge that and say all right the writers got this right but they got this wrong and a guy like louis tion belongs in there and i know he's got that biography out that's on my to-do list and uh, you know i certainly will get to it i think I've, I've got the time right now exactly that's one thing we all have is is plenty of time unfortunately with uh, what's going on in the world so before we let you go we're on social media where on the web where's the best place to buy the book Oh, well, um, yeah, I think that, you know, Amazon is obviously, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local booksellers, they can they can handle that, but uh, on Twitter, I'm at, at Brian Hoke, B-R-Y-A-N-H-O-C-H, you can read my work at yankees.com, and I've also got a website at brian-hoke.com, and um, all the links to, to buy the book are right there, you can see some of, some of my other work, and some photos, and videos, and all that good stuff, so we're, uh, we're definitely all digital with that. Sounds great. Thank you, Brian, for joining us today. You got it. Thank you so much.